There was a lot of what ifing, of wondering if I'd taken the wrong paths, if I'd kind of missed it. And I think in the last year, it's, it has been realizing, oh, no, I actually have all the ingredients, all the things that I've experienced, you know, with the good and the bad, it's all coming together in a really perfect way. Hello, you are listening to the Late Bloomer Living podcast, where we are reimagining and redefining what it means to be in midlife where we are gathering energy, momentum, and excitement for our next chapter via candid conversations with other midlifers about their own pivots, pitfalls, and triumphs. I'm Yvonne Marchese, your host, and I'm so happy you're here. Midlife is demanding. It often demands extra of us. Our jobs might demand more of us. We might be caretakers of both our children and our parents at the same time. And that's if we're lucky. We probably all dread the passing of our parents. I'm one of the lucky ones at the moment. Both of my parents are still alive. But I've heard it from many sources that after people lose their parents, there's the feeling of being an orphan, even if they lose their parents late in life. My guest today is Charlene Lamb, whose mother passed away unexpectedly at age 66 from a stroke. And when that happened, Charlene found herself feeling at sea, um, unmoored, if you will. She was in her 30s at the time, and as an only child, she was tasked with having to sell and empty out her mother's dream home. Now, Charlene has a background working with makers, artisans, and designers to help them curate and sell their creations. But now, faced with a lifetime of collected precious items that had been important to her mother, she found herself feeling overwhelmed and unable to let go of anything. That's when she asked herself, okay, if I was to do an exhibition about my mother, which 100 objects would I choose? This simple question has led her to embrace a new mission doing groundbreaking work around the topic of grief. She calls herself a grief guide and has developed a creative three-part framework that helps guide people through their grief journey in a practical and accessible way. She did, in fact, end up putting on an exhibition in London about her mother and the grief process called Proof of Life. She has such a unique point of view about the grief process and this whole thing led her down a whole new path in her life. I really can't wait for you to meet her. So without further ado, here's Charlene Lamb. Let's go. Charlene, thank you so much for being here with me today. It's so good to be here. Joining you from Lisbon today. No, from Lisbon, you made your move. I'm so excited because we talked about doing this and it just seems, it's so funny. It seems like it was so long ago. And yet I looked at my calendar yesterday and went, oh, I'm talking to Charlene tomorrow. Oh my gosh. How did that come up around so fast? Just seems like that's the story of my life. That's how the move to Portugal feels. <laughs> really? Oh my goodness. Well, before I lose the thread, I, I don't know why I always love to do this. I like to talk about where I know people from and you and I met in the What Works Network. So I just want to give a massive shout out to Tara McMullen Shannon, all you other lovely people at What Works, if anybody's listening. Um, I love that connection. Yes. Like that entrepreneurs. Monday huddle, that Monday <laughs> huddle for me has just been like, right? So guys, the Hyundai, the I should explain that. The Monday Huddle was established within the What Works Network, which is a network for small business people to connect and talk about what's working in their business. And we just kind of commiserate and it's 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 great and we give each other like yo this is what's working for me oh i tried that that didn't work so well and but covid right was the establishment mm-hmm. of the monday huddle and so we meet for like it's so short it's like it's a half hour so short it goes by so fast it's always too fast and it's just like a little zoom call and we just kind of touch back and that for me like connecting with you guys in that room every monday it has just been man like a touchstone. Yes. The Monday huddle is what I call it. I mean, I have these things in my calendar called anchor events Mm. and the Monday huddle in the what works network has become an anchor event 
for my me week too. For me too. And that there's the times I have to miss it. Like I, I, things have just been a little nutty lately and I've mm-hmm. had to miss it. And I'm like, okay, I'm feeling it. I need to get back. I need to get back yes. to it, you know? And so. I'm a big introvert, so, but I think. Me too. Have, yeah. So it's so strange right? for the past year to have sometimes craved interaction and community, mm-hmm. but I think it really kind of called to mind. Oh yeah. I really look forward to these touch points with people and with entrepreneurs who really kind of get what it's like to be running a business, mm-hmm. um, but also entrepreneurs who have really different backgrounds and different businesses. So I love that glimpse into other people's worlds as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, again, always a reminder of, oh, it's possible to run a business yeah. selling puzzles or right. you know whatever kind of services I've never even heard of. So right. I love that. And it's just such a safe space. I mean, you know, it, it's, uh, yeah, it's just a safe space. It feels really good. Well, I'm yes. so glad we're here one-on-one Me together because one-on-one is actually my favorite way to, is my favorite way to roll. Because um, you're an introvert. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so this is, this is just dreamy. And you, when we first talked, I mean, you were like, I'm moving to Portugal. And I'm like, What? So tell, yeah. and you did it, you've done it. And you've only been there two days. You just told me. I am still jet lagged <laughs> for sure. I the am red so eye. honored that you're on a call with me right now. I'm like, what? I can't, I can't even believe it, but tell me how it's all gone. Why did you move to Portugal? What's going on for you? Yeah, I figured, you know, freshly moved is the best time to talk to Yvonne about pivots and changes. Um, Cause when we met, I was probably in Brooklyn, um, unless I was traveling elsewhere. Not that we did a lot of traveling, but we kind of did a reconnaissance trip here um, to kind of scope it out, scope out Lisbon, make sure it was really where we wanted to be. Um, and when I say we, I'm saying my husband and I. But my, I grew up in New York, um, so in Chinatown, in Manhattan. So New York, I always thought would be my anchor and home Um, but I actually moved to California when I was a kid, went to school there, went to Berkeley and met my husband out there. We moved around a lot, um, both when we were growing up individually, but even together where, um, he got his master's degree in Sweden. So we lived in Sweden for a bit, Northern Uh Sweden. Uh Um, and we were both born in Europe actually, and grew up with traveling families. Um, my mom was a travel agent and loved to travel throughout my life, which I'm so grateful for. So there'd always been this kind of inkling of like, oh, okay, maybe Europe is in the cards. We were living in New York at the time. And this was, oh gosh, maybe 15 years ago. And we're thinking, you know what? New York is really comfortable, but maybe there's something more. And that's when he got his master's in Sweden. And then afterwards we moved to London. Wow. And we were in London for eight years. Oh and my goodness. So yeah, so I can mm-hmm. totally see this is not a huge, a huge leap. <laughs> really. It's not my first leap. But not your first leap. Exactly. Wow. So exciting. I'm yeah. I feel like I'm living vicariously through you. This is very cool. <laughs> Sorry, I feel like I need to make a chart as to like all the back and forth and stuff. <laughs> no, we where... can have one of those little airplanes where it goes yes. and you get the little line on the map. Show where is Charlene now? Okay, cool. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, but after eight years in London, I was kind of craving home a bit. Um, and New York always felt like home in my heart. Um, so I thought we were kind of going back for, to stay. Um, and I'd always assumed that I would settle in New York, retire there. My mom was living there. So I'd always kind of assumed that, well, yes, okay, we can have a European adventure, but I'll have to go home to take care of my mother. Mm -hmm. So that was always the assumption. Mm -hmm. Um, And then eight years ago, she passed away unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. And I was living in London at the time. She had bought her dream house in New York. Mm -hmm. And that was so tough. And I feel like I keep on bringing up the word anchor. But my mom was my anchor to this place. And once she was gone, suddenly it became this question of, oh, okay, if that assumption that I have this anchor in this place 
if that's no longer true, what else is possible? So even though we came back to New York, really enjoyed it. Um, as hard as the pandemic was to experience in New York, we were really lucky in that we already knew how to work remotely and we were living in a comfortable apartment. Mm -hmm. So New York treated us really well during the past year of lockdown, quarantine, working from home. And luckily we're both introverts. So that helps a lot. Um, you have some friends out in California and they're like, we were made for this. We're fine. <laughs> yes. I've been in training for this. <laughs> yes. And I'm like, I'm, yeah, kind of me too. And I, is this horrible to say, but I kind of miss the lockdown. Well, there's certain aspects of it, yeah. you know, um, it, it, there, introverts were definitely better suited for it. I yeah. definitely felt bad for extroverts. Me too. And I've talked <laughs> to like, a few of them. I'm, yeah. you know, feel for them because they're like, they need that, that contact, right? Yes. Yeah. And in so many ways, I felt like I was in training because I was an introvert. I was a germaphobe already. Oh, so I, yeah. I already so, knew like, you have to wash your face, you know, your hands really well. Right. You have to not touch your face. You know, that the first couple of months, I kept on telling my husband, stop touching your face, stop mm -hmm. touching your face. So I was already prepared for that germaphobe kind of aspect of things. Did it freak um, you out a little bit extra though, being a germaphobe? Did that play against you during this? I know it's a little off topic, but mm, I wonder. No, because I mean, I was hyper vigilant, but it felt like we needed to be hyper vigilant because especially in the beginning, we didn't know there was so much we didn't know. Right. And I'd also watched a lot of zombie movies. So I'm sorry. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I was not expecting the conversation to go there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> go, go ahead. <laughs> Part of it is about how all these various things I've been thinking about this, about especially for women's lives, about <laughs> how we have this kind of purse aspect to life yeah. where, you know, how our purses have like tissue, there's oh, like yeah. gum in there. You might need, right? There's a cough drop in there. Right. And I really do kind of feel like looking at my life currently that all the stuff that's been in my purse of life has come in handy now. So, so you've got to tell me where the zombie movies come in. Hold on. Because I don't understand. Because all the things you experience, right? Being an introvert prepares you for not having much contact for people. Right. Watching a lot of zombie movies means you are aware of, oh, yes, of course you have to stock up on things. Oh, yes, of course, there will be the experience of people in denial. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course, you have to watch out for people who won't tell you that they've been bitten. And those are the ones who will actually bring oh, everyone down. Oh my gosh. So, I see it. <laughs> so I felt like I'd, I was kind of mentally prepared for yeah. a lot of the things that happened yeah. that were out of our control. Um, right. Oh my gosh. That's really what it is. Isn't that what zombie movies are really all about is being, is not having control. Yes. And, oh you know, gosh. not being able to trust as much as you would like. And mm -hmm. sometimes there's a breakdown of government. And so I just felt so lucky in a way that I was so prepared. Um, also, I had gotten my anxiety under control. So after my mom died um, and I was dealing with her estate, there was a lot involved with flying back and forth to take care of her house and empty it and sell it. So my anxiety got really bad. Um, so a couple of years ago, I discovered coaching and self-coaching. I had lots and lots of years of therapy, but I would say my anxiety was just kind of barely managed. Um, and it was kind of lurching from anxiety crisis to crisis. So after my mom died and I felt like, Ooh, okay. It's getting kind of hard to leave the house. Hmm. My anxiety is not at a level that it hasn't been before. Mm. So I was so grateful that I had learned how to manage my anxiety before the pandemic happened. Mm -hmm. If you can imagine what it would be like for a germaphobe with uncontrolled anxiety. Well, that was my first thought was just being a germaphobe, I would think would, you know, to, to be put in a position where all of a sudden everything is, is, you know, life or death germ, mm -hmm. right? 
that that would be a, tr- a trigger for sure. And to not have your anxiety under control on top of it. Whew, yeah, that would have been, that would have been something. Thank goodness. And I spoke to other people. Yes. And I How spoke to other people with your anxiety. Anxiety under control. Like what, what have you done to, to manage that? That's amazing. Well, it was, like I said, I'd had a lot of years of therapy. Um, my first bout with, I guess really, it was really depression, but I think my anxiety actually becomes depression when it gets too bad. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think anxiety is my pretty, pretty highly, aren't they? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I think as you understand that more, you know, I looking back at my patterns, I would realize, Oh, okay. I see what happened. I put so much pressure on myself that my anxiety would get so high that in order to get away from the anxiety and the pressure, I would slip into depression to kind of get away from it, to give mm-hmm. myself a break. Mm -hmm. So I can look back and kind of see those patterns in high school or in college when that would happen. Mm -hmm. So I had had a lot of therapy for anxiety. So I was very Mm -hmm. (laughs) self-aware. I was very aware of my thoughts. Um, And, but what that just results in is a very self-aware and anxious person, someone who's (laughs) really aware that they're really anxious. So (laughs) it was discovering, um, the life coaching it's a, don't have is to it the life part. coach school is it Brooke the Castillo? life coach school yeah the life yeah. coach school podcast yeah great um, podcast people listen get you don't need to be a, a life coach to nope. listen to it especially the earlier episodes yes um, starting with the first the very first episodes and go work up oh my gosh that's a tremendous tool so you yes. found that uh-huh. The podcast and the host herself has anxiety. Mm-hmm. So it was the f- maybe one of the first times where I heard pe- someone talking about anxiety in a really matter of fact way, but also in a way that said, you know what, I have it and I still accomplish a ton with it mm-hmm. because I manage it. And that opened up a new world for me because I thought I was kind of resigned to, okay, I have anxiety. I'm going to have to deal with it all my life. It might handicap me a bit. I might not be able to run the kinds of business and the businesses that my concern was I wouldn't be able to run the kind of business that other people might because I have anxiety. Mm -hmm. I might not be able to do the things that other people do because I have to manage my anxiety. Mm -hmm. So I kind of assumed that I would be limited by it. So to be presented by a coaching framework, oh, I love a framework, a practical framework to apply Mm -hmm. to the anxiety, Mm -hmm. it changed everything. So I I listened to the podcast, I joined the program, and then I decided to actually certify as a life coach. And not even so much to coach others, um, though I thought that's what I was doing. I think I actually learned to be a life coach so that I could understand how to hold space for myself. Mm. There's this phrase that coaches and therapists use of holding space, you know, creating a safe container, creating a dedicated time, a safe space for someone to really explore their thoughts, their emotions, and talk about things. And learning how to hold that space of unconditional love and acceptance for myself, mm-hmm. I think was the key. And yeah. anxiety isn't, I don't, it's, it's just something that I manage, but it doesn't hold me back anymore. So that was amazing. <laughs> that is, that is amazing. That is amazing. I'm so happy for you that you've, you've found the key for yourself, um, to do that. Cause that can be crippling. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you you're in the pandemic and I mean, I want to go back to, if you don't mind, I, I knew yeah. this was a pivotal moment for you, but your mom passing, mm-hmm. I know that yeah. that was, and that's been eight years, right? Yes. Yes. But there was something that happened for you within that. Right. And that, that now is only starting to, I think, come to a fruition yeah. or like a flowering of a sorts. Yes. Yes. I think, you know, when we talk about pivots, um, I think people in your podcast have talked about losses and trauma and grief being a turning point. Mm -hmm. And when I think about losing my mom, um, 
when I think of what was the pivotal moment, it wasn't the loss, even though that was huge. It was the recovery from it. It was realizing that one, I could handle it. Um, it was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. It was one of the loneliest things I've experienced dealing with the aftermath of her loss. And again, as an introvert, I don't really feel lonely much. So that was a novel experience. Mm -hmm. um, it was really hard on my marriage. My husband really didn't understand how to support me. Mm -hmm. um, and when I decided to coach, to learn how to coach, I thought maybe I would coach for anxiety since that was my path to learning about coaching. Mm -hmm. But then I realized, you know what? I think people really need help with grief. Grief, I think this year in particular, it's come to the forefront more. The New York Times is doing articles on it. Mm -hmm. It's been good to see people talking about it because there's been so much collective grief and individual grief. Mm -hmm. And it does really tie back to my own experience of losing my mother. Um, and again, I think, I think maybe I just really like finding silver linings. Maybe it's a hobby. <laughs> maybe it's a coping mechanism. But it's a good one. I was so <laughs> it is. <laughs> there, it could be worse. <laughs> Way worse. <laughs> but I think I was grateful that I had already had so much therapy and had figured out, if not how to manage my anxiety, to at least look after myself and take care of myself. Because as difficult as losing my mother was and dealing with her estate, I was able to kind of guide myself through that grief journey in a way that I felt I emerged stronger, more loving, more compassionate. And I'll, I'll share with you what I was doing at the time. <laughs> There's yeah. a lot of, it, it, again, this is this purse approach where it feels nonlinear and it feels like the steps might be all over the place, but it does all connect. Um, so at the time that my mother died, she was living in New York, about an hour north of the city. I was in London. I was working as an independent curator um, and a design consultant. She passed from a stroke really suddenly at the age of 66. Totally unexpected. So young. So young. Um, and so I had to put things on hold. I had to fly back. She had this 3,000 square foot house full of things. Mm -hmm. um, and I tried to hold on to it, but there was a mortgage on it and I had to sell it, which meant I had to empty it out. Mm. And that was an enormous challenge. And I think a challenge that a lot of people experience, yeah. but my kind of instincts as a curator kicked in. I was so doing when you, can you mm -hmm. back up for just a yeah, quick second? Sure. Because when you say you were a curator, I'm not sure. Yeah. So a curator for, um, Yes. Explain that to me a little bit, like draw that out. So I understand what you were doing as a curator, because there's different yes, kinds of please. curators, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't want to step on moment curators toes or anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I say independent curator. Uh -huh. So independent curators might work with organizations or you might just do your own projects and self-initiated projects. Uh -huh. So in London, I had connected with the maker community and okay. artisans there and designers. Mm -hmm. My background is in journalism, but also in surface and textile design. Mm -hmm. And I also have a background in marketing. So I connected with people there who were making beautiful things, but it did not necessarily know how to sell them or present them. Mm. So what I wound up doing is saying, I'll take your things and I'll put it in an exhibition. I'll put it in a pop-up shop and help you sell it and help you learn how to talk about it and how to tell the story of what you do. Mm. So that's what I was doing in London. Got it. So I was already regularly putting on exhibitions. Mm -hmm. So when I was in my mom's house, faced with 3,000 square feet of stuff mm -hmm. that suddenly all seemed very, very precious because yeah. my mom had owned it, you know, that McDonald's toy, she had selected it. Right. And suddenly I couldn't let anything go. Right. Um, so then I kind of asked myself the question, okay, if I was to do an exhibition about my mother, which 100 objects 
would I choose? Mm. And that was the question that one kind of gave me the practical approach of how to filter through all these things that I, I had to either put in storage or take back with me in a suitcase. Mm. And then also it became also a creative practice where I did eventually put on an exhibition in London that was around grief Mm -hmm. and it was called proof of life Mm -hmm. because, um, in the early stages of dealing with an estate, you're very much in the proof of death stage where Mm -hmm. it's like, everyone's asking for the death certificate. You're doing paperwork. You're answering questions. You're planning a memorial. And then at some stage you move into what I call the proof of life stage where you focus on not how the person died, when they died, and all the details, but you focus on how they lived. Mm -hmm. So for me with my mom, there was a very distinct movement from that one phase of dealing, just dealing and trying to survive to moving forward to, okay, that really hard part is done. And now I can just focus on how my mom was. Mm. And that's the proof of life stage. So part of the process for that really was selling the house, letting go of her dream house. But it was also putting on this exhibition with some of those objects that I had kept from her house that I thought represented her best. Mm. And I invited other artists to exhibit things that they had made in memory of people. Mm -hmm. And it was such a a transformative experience, certainly for me. What a beautiful way to celebrate that. Oh my gosh. It was the memorial I wanted to give her. Yeah. The actual memorial was, you know, it's always a little bit odd. (laughs) Right. Funerals and memorials are odd. It brings out really strange responses in people. So the exhibition was what I wanted to really have her be remembered in the way that kind of expressed the relationship that I had with her. Mm -hmm. And in putting together that exhibition, I realized, aha, I had created my own framework for helping myself through grief. Mm -hmm. And what if I could share this framework with other people? Mm -hmm. So long story back around of like, why am I in Portugal again? (laughs) The short version. I tell you, there's always, there's always, you know, it's hard to tell somebody's story without really, really going back and being like, okay, okay. But there's this one thing that we have to talk about first before we can talk about this other thing. Right. I mean, (laughs) they're integrally tied, right? Yes. Yes, yes, there's so many threads, right? Textile background. There are threads that come together. There are yarns yes. that get woven together. And sometimes it looks like a loose thread, but it's really tied together. There's your textile and background right there. <laughs> exactly. We've right. got the weave and the weft for you, you know, textile <laughs> geeks. Um, but I think it's, yes, I could have made an outline and given a talk, but this isn't a talk. This is just, like, we're having a conversation. It's a conversation with Yvonne. <laughs> So, but the reason I'm in Portugal is because I realized as much as I love New York, our lifestyle there wasn't sustainable. Um, I was thinking of that even late 2019, just looking at the cost of living, um, looking at how much health care was after having lived in the UK and, you know, having benefited from the NHS, mm-hmm. we were spending, I was like 1500 to $2,000 a month on health care for the two of us. Yeah. because we're both self-employed. Mm-hmm. And yeah, just late 2019, I was thinking, I love this city, but this is not a sustainable way of living. Mm-hmm. What are some other options now that- And so when you're done, talking about a sustainable way of living, this is like future thinking, right? You're thinking about, I mean, you're, you're, you're fine in the moment, right? But yes. you're talking about like, this is like projecting out you're, you're how old again now? Sorry, I just turned saying. 44, I think. Right. And <laughs> so, and you're, you're starting to think, okay, what, what is my, what does my life look like further down the line? Right. Yes. 
Yeah. Yes. And really projecting forward, even five years, could we afford to buy a place? Probably not at the rate that we were burning through money. Um, mm-hmm. And where would we be able to retire? Would we be able to afford health care? Mm-hmm. Will I ever be able to afford having a studio space, like an outside studio space again? Mm-hmm. Not in Brooklyn, not in New York. Mm-hmm. And if we're evaluating some of our life choices or life circumstances, you know, I'd mentioned my mom was my anchor to New York. And if my mom was gone, then New York didn't have to be the place. And we had decided not to have children. So if we had made that life choice, what does that make possible? And we had already been expats before, so we knew we could do it. Mm-hmm. But the big thing um, was the big difference for this move to Portugal um, was that it was my initiative. All the other moves in my life had been, oh, my parents decided to make this move from New York to California. I had a sad story about that. I moved to follow my husband for his school. I had a sad story about that. Followed him for his job. I was a trailing spouse. Mm-hmm. You know, had a painful story about that. So I had always perceived and associated long distance moves with being forced to move Mm -hmm. and with loss Mm -hmm. um, and with losing friends and losing touch with family. This move to Portugal is one that I initiated that I looked at and said, I want to be in a place that's more affordable, that has healthcare that's affordable, that just offers a better quality of life and the potential to have the space both mentally and emotionally and physically to do more creative work and to actually pursue the grief work. This creative process that I'd come up with, this three-part framework for dealing with grief and processing it, I suddenly started to get the inkling, you know what, I really need to tell more people about it. But so much of my time and energy was being taken up by the client work that I do as a communications consultant Mm -hmm. that I was thinking, no, if we stay in New York, I might never have the time and the space to do it. I need to find a way of living that gives us that space. That gives me that space to pursue this grief work. That's so important to me. So that's why Portugal. Oh, and also sunshine and sardines. (laughs) That's why. <laughs> Sunshine and Sardines. I think I have the title for this particular episode. <laughs> I, was like, I think it's my podcast or my blog. I'm not Sunshine sure. Sunshine and Sardines. I love it. Oh my gosh. That's awesome. <laughs> or your memoir. <laughs> one of several. So one of several. <laughs> oh my goodness. Isn't it amazing how life can take you on this windy path, right? So I do want to back up for a second because we didn't talk about your community communications work. So mm. this is what your, your, your trans, your, your, tra- what am I trying to say? You're, you're transitioning out of, you were doing curation mm-hmm. before, and then was there a missing piece in there that, so you, you started doing communications work or is that tied still to the curating? It is because, well, I thought I wanted to be a journalist. Um, I was the editor of my newspaper in high school, and then I thought I was going to pursue journalism. And then I realized that Berkeley does not actually have an undergraduate journalism degree after Mm -hmm. I got there. Um, And then the dot-com boom happened, Mm -hmm. and everyone said, well, paper journalism is dying anyway. It's all about the internet. Mm -hmm. And and I almost quit school in order to work for AOL. Remember them? Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) You got mail. (laughs) Uh-huh. Yes. <laughs> so telling stories, it, talking to people, finding stories and articulating them has always been an important part of what I wanted to do. And so my work background was in marketing and audience development and content creation and writing and journalism. And then after the top, dot com bust, I wanted to work with things that weren't just pixels, that weren't just on a screen. Mm -hmm. that's when I got my second degree in surface and textile design. Got it. When I got to London, I combined those and said, oh, I have a marketing background and I have a design degree. 
I thought I was going to do my own work, but actually there's amazing talent in the UK that need help telling their stories. Let me tell their stories, both in words and in writing about them, but also in physical space, because I also have like a visual merchandising background. Mm -hmm. So all those skills came together in what I was doing in London. And then when I moved to New York, retail space was really hard to come by. (laughs) Right. So I focused more on the communications work and on the marketing work and content creation for design brands and for creatives. Got it. So put the pop-ups and exhibitions on hold for a while because I couldn't quite find the right spaces, Mm -hmm. again, both physically and mentally Mm -hmm. to put on the exhibitions that I love putting on. So I focused on the communications consulting work for design brands. And that's what I have been doing. And it's interesting because when we first spoke, I was kind of framing it as, oh, it's this is a move away from the work I have been doing. But just in the last week, I think with this move, with being in Lisbon, I've realized this work, the grief work that I want to do mm-hmm. is really just an evolution of the work that I have been doing. Mm-hmm. I still work with words. I still work with creatives. It's just that I'm now adding this grief coaching, this grief guiding element mm-hmm. to the work. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it totally does. That, that's kind of why I wanted to kind of circle back to that mm-hmm. that link between your your existence in London and then New York and where you are now going to Portugal. It's interesting because each of them, are tied to a physical move for you. Yes. And it's really interesting. And in you know, you've taken each each part of yourself and and your experience and your talent and you you've tweaked it each time. Just with just like a little oh, okay, let's tweak it this way now and let's tweak it that way. And it's that's what I think is so um available to us as we look at the possibility of reinventing ourselves in midlife is not, it's not about like, I, I don't, I don't want people to feel like they need to change themselves. It's something is wrong. It's really more about exploring that, um, the following the intuition, follow doing that kind of tweak and, and getting in touch with, okay, I have a wealth of experience and cataloging it and looking at it and going, what could I do with that? Where could I go from here? You know, so I'm so excited for you to. Me too. Oh my gosh. (laughs) And I think that's exactly right. You know, I think a lot of us, when we get to a certain age or when we're no longer the ingenue, you know, Mm -hmm. and like, oh, the youngest smart one in the company with all the ideas, letting go of identities like that. I think for me, there was certainly a period where I looked back and thought, I missed it. I missed my chance. Mm -hmm. I I should have worked for Google. I was Mm -hmm. living in Silicon Valley. Why didn't I work for Google? Um, I should have taken anthropology classes at school. I I think maybe that would have guided me to maybe like more of a design research position. There was a lot of what ifing Mm -hmm. of wondering if I'd taken the wrong paths, if I'd kind of missed it. And I think in the last year, it's, it has been realizing, oh no, I actually have all the ingredients, Mm -hmm. all the things that I've experienced, you know, with the good and the bad, it's all coming together in a really perfect way. And with the grief work, with the grief work, just to explain a bit about how the creatives kind of come in Mm -hmm. for the exhibition that I did about my mom, I also started commissioning work. So I've always enjoyed commissioning work from artists and designers and creatives as part of the exhibitions that I would do in London. Mm -hmm. But After my mom died, I started commissioning work from ceramicists, from illustrators, and from artists that I had already worked with, but in memory of my mother. Hmm. So every year, I would set aside a certain amount and commission new work. And 
for this first exhibition that I did, I commissioned an illustrator to illustrate a series of her belongings. And it was things like, you know, her collection of scarves, but also ways that I wanted to remember her. It was an illustration that was, you know, her love of the Belgian waffles, odd things like that, but also delicious meals at her table. And there was something about creating something new that was kind of the last part of my grief journey to where I am now. Wow. Oh my and- gosh. My brain is bl- about to <laughs> just pop right out of my head right now. That is, I love the way different people think. I would, <laughs> I would never in a million years think to do something like that, to commission artwork about somebody I love and the things that 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 will remind me of the best parts of them or the things that I loved about them. How amazing, what an amazing idea. Yeah. And, you know, that first exhibition was in 2015. And just this May, I did a second version of that illustration commission mm-hmm. and showed it in Brooklyn just before moving. Wow. And it was working with a Brooklyn-based illustrator And instead of having her illustrate my mom's belongings exclusively, I opened it up to other people, including people in our What Works Entrepreneur Network, to ask them the question of, what did you keep of the person that you lost? Mm. And people sent photos, and I had the illustrator do a new series of illustrations. They're in an online gallery. Um, I have a website called griefgritgrace.com. there's an online gallery portion to it. So the illustrations are up on there. And then we exhibited the original paintings. Before we got on and I was like looking at this, um, the cross, like the, some, the pens, the cross mm-hmm. and the Parker pens. Can you tell yes. me what that, uh, where that came from? Yeah. So there was this question that was then posed to people. What did you keep? And I approached this illustrator I'd met previously, just I liked her work. Mm -hmm. And when I told her about this project, I didn't know her personal story, but she had lost her father over 10 years ago. And she realized, oh, I have his collection of pens. I would love to illustrate them. So that became one of the collections. So that Mm -hmm. series is called His Collection of Pens. And it's the artist's own father's pens that she lovingly illustrated and some of the other categories are, you know, her favorite purses and it's one of my mom's purses, but also purses of the mother and grandmother of two people who are in our entrepreneur network. Um, There are their cooking tools, all the things that we kind of keep that have meaning to us. And I think one of the reasons I like not just showing the photograph, Mm -hmm. but commissioning artwork is when you abstract something that personal into an illustration, it somehow connects the personal experience with the universal experience. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe that's not what your mom's lipstick looked like, but maybe you remember someone else's lipstick and you can make that connection. It abstracts the object and somehow makes it more relatable and, Mm -hmm. I find that when we do exhibitions like this, it's an invitation for people to share their own experiences with grief and loss. And I think that is my version of creating space, of that idea of holding space for someone for their grief and for sharing and for connection. I think an exhibition, the creation of a piece of art, the experience of witnessing a piece of art and connecting with the artist, but also connecting with other people who are viewing it, Mm -hmm. that in and itself can be a space for sharing. And that's why I love art (laughs) and design. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. There's, um, there's one of the, uh, a, a, uh, well, it's a locket, but when I first looked at it, it made me think of my, my grandmother used to, um, she had a bunch of, uh, pocket, like 
watches that were on chains. So yes. she had those old fashioned watches that looked like lockets and you would pop them open and there would be this magical timepiece inside and she wore them as, as a necklace, you know? And when I saw that, it made instantly made me think of my grandmother. Yes. You know? And I love the stories that people have shared. Yeah. There's so much love in the stories that people share. Mm-hmm. And I'll let you in on the background for this. Of I kind of mentioned this three-part framework. So how does that connect? How do the exhibitions connect to that three-part framework? Right. And I think you also asked as well, like, well, what does a curator mean? Well, if we pull it back to the essentials of what a curator does, say I'm putting, putting together a show, there are three main steps for me collect, curate, and create. So if I'm putting together a show, the collect phase is where I look at all the possible things that I could show. Maybe it's a ceramics exhibition and I'm looking at all the different ceramicists that I could choose from or all the different pieces. Curate is where I choose which ones I want to spotlight, which ones I want to highlight that I want to have seen in order to create the experience and the exhibition that I want. Mm -hmm. So three steps, I collect, curate, create. Mm -hmm. But those are also essentially the steps for what you do when you're coaching yourself. And it's kind of the basis for cognitive behavioral therapy, where Mm -hmm. you look at all the thoughts that you have, all the memories, all the things that are there, And then you choose which ones best serve you, which Mm -hmm. ones you want to take forward with you. Mm -hmm. And in choosing that, you create your experience of your own life. And you also create relationships. So the Mm -hmm. memories that I choose, for instance, with my mom, I can look at all the stories and memories I have of her, good and bad. I have plenty of thoughts and stories that cause regret in pain. Mm-hmm. And I have really happy stories. And I choose mostly to keep the ones that are attached to good feelings and good memories. Mm-hmm. And that helps me to create really my ongoing relationship with her. Mm-hmm. So that's that process of applying that collect, curate, and create framework to my thoughts and memories. I love that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's terrific. Yeah. It's, um, I always think of it as like awareness of, so the first step is, is being aware of your thoughts and then reframing, you know, your thoughts and then, and then that, that creation, like looking again, it, is that serving you? Is that, is that thought, you know, is that thought serving you whether or not you think it's true? Yes. (laughs) Yes. And because truth, uh, you know, it's there's, there's, you know, so if you can, if you can look at just the, just the value of a thought based on whether or not it, how it makes you feel and is it going to serve you going forward? And then that gives you something to create from, right? Yes. And I think the creation phase is so fun Yeah. because I think sometimes in therapy, we think, oh, okay, now I have to ask myself, does it serve me? And it feels a little judgmental sometimes. It feels a little grim. Mm-hmm. And I think if we can turn that question into something that's potentially joyful mm. and say, not only does it serve me, but does it help me to create the life that I want moving forward. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. And also, you know, you brought up your grandmother's uh, watches around a chain. Why did you select that particular memory or that particular object? You know, it just popped out at me as I was scrolling through. It's, it's, it's interesting how you things pop out at you. You know, Mm -hmm. so I'm scrolling through, I scrolled through and I saw the purses and, you know, I see that connection for that person and the pens is like, I see that connection for that person. And then all of a sudden this image of a locket popped up and it just had an instant, Mm -hmm. like just, I just instantly felt connected to that and boom, there was my grandmother, you know, and I remember being little and sitting with her and looking at those 
the, you know, sitting on her lap and seeing that around her neck and her hands, she had arthritis. And so for forever, her hands were gnarled and old looking, even when, you know, I'm sure she was probably in her forties or (laughs) fifties, right? She seemed ancient to me as a young girl, right? And, uh, but part of it was just the age of her hands. And so the I can, it all kind of comes together, doesn't it? Isn't it amazing how yes. one little thing will just like, whoop, and there you are and, and transported in space and time. Yes. And I think that's the magic of objects. And that's why I think throughout my life, I've been obsessed a bit with objects, whether they're, you know, as design objects and as a curator of like, yeah, but how do you choose an object? How do you showcase it? Put it on a plinth, make it special, make people see it in the way that I kind of want them to notice things about it. Mm -hmm. So it was like, I love that your grandmother's piece brought back all these really specific memories about her and your relationship with her. And like, how does it make you feel when you think of these memories. Right. Right. Yeah. It brings, it it brings her right here. She's here now for just a, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's all related. You know, it's when I ask people to choose a particular object to talk about, about their person, they're actually going through those three steps. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they could have chosen any object you know, I'm sure you have lots of memories of your grandmother, mm-hmm. yeah. but it popped up that particular piece that you wanted to choose to keep and kind of cherish that memory. And in choosing these kind of memories that keep us thinking about our people with affection and love, I really do believe it helps to maintain this relationship with them. Yeah, Not necessarily in a woo-woo way, but just in a, you know what? I, I like thinking about my mom. Because yeah. I choose the happier thoughts most times. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow. Wow, wow, wow. You are a wise woman, Charlene Lama. I knew that <laughs> from, from our... <laughs> from all your contributions in our, in our, uh, Monday huddles, but, uh, yeah. Wow. You've completely blown my mind today. Oh, you're too kind. Thank you so much for, um, steering the conversation and steering my loops back around. Um, because there's, there are so many threads. <laughs> there are so many. And here you are in Portugal two days. And you're in an Airbnb. So what's the next step? Like, oh my gosh, so exciting. Finding a space Mm -hmm. to, again, anchor. Mm -hmm. (laughs) A space, a physical space to feel safe and to call my own. And then once we have the living space, I want to look for studio space, exhibition space. Mm -hmm. Because now that we're, fingers crossed, coming out of lockdowns and meeting more in person, Um, I will be connecting with doing grief circles online and continuing through Zoom, but I really do want to have these physical spaces where people can meet, we can have exhibitions that showcase the objects that people have left behind. I can commission more work from designers. I can create this connection and these spaces for connection. So that's really the next step. You know, I've done the work and done the research and, oh my gosh, the paperwork (laughs) to get us here in pursuit of the space to really develop the next stage of my life. And I feel like it's actually happening. So now it's just taking everything out of my head and putting it into reality. Yeah. Mm, Yeah. mm, mm, mm. I feel like, I feel like, and there's this whole, this whole other thing that, I, I just purely want to talk to you about because I'm, I, I'm totally selfish. Of course, this whole podcast for me is selfish reasons. I, I, you know, what am I saying? But like to talk to you about this expat kind of experience that you're having, like, what yes. did you do? How did you figure out Portugal? <laughs> what are you going to do next? How do you, what's the health insurance? What, how do you do these? What do you find? How do you find a place to live? And she showed me people. She showed me uh, as we got on the view of what's the name of the river that you have a view of from there again? Oh, it's, it's I think the Tagus River. The Tag- it's spelled T-A-G-U-S in Gorgeous. Lisbon. Gorgeous. Yes. Oh my gosh. This view that you've got there is just, ah, uh, 
There are a lot of videos. So if you want to know that information for sure, but I guess I'll leave you with like one of my, I love analogies, of course. So my, one of the analogies that I work with is this idea of being the captain of your own ship, Mm -hmm. that it's like, it's a wide open ocean and a lot of people wind up stuck on other people's ships and suddenly they wind up someplace they didn't even want to be. So being brave enough to be the captain of your own ship to go where you want to go. Mm -hmm. But that also means being a good navigator and being a good sailor. So to me, being a good sailor is like, okay, it is things like getting your mental health under control. It is kind of working on resilience. Being a good navigator is saying, okay, if I'm going to be the captain of my own ship and go places and do things in ways that maybe people haven't done before, then I also need to figure out how to navigate there. So there, I'm a DIY expat, you know, my company doesn't move me. I have to figure it out. So it's become a process of being comfortable being my own navigator and finding the resources and finding my own ways to get to where I want. Mm -hmm. And being comfortable with not knowing how it's all going to exactly fall into place clearly, because you're there in a temporary space. You're not yes. there. You haven't landed. It's kind of like the way I, when I moved to New York City and when I was in my mid twenties, I had sold everything I owned, but I, I knew one person in New York ever and and not well. I, I had been <laughs> in a couple of his plays in Denver, and I so I said, "Can I stay with you and your wife for a week and look <laughs> for a place?" So I had no job. I had no place to live. And, uh, I did save money. So, so I had, Mm -hmm. I had some money and I had gone, I went up to Maine for like a month (laughs) to stay in my aunt's house and then took the bus in to New York for that week and just pounded the pavement. This was like mid nineties, pounded the pavement, went to to some random roommate service finally (laughs) in midtown Manhattan that had, it was all pre-internet, right? free cell phones. I, they had binders with sheets of paper that people had filled out with like the specs of their apartment and who they were and wh- and where what and I don't, and I found a roommate that way and I'm like, "Oh my gosh, you know." And you didn't get murdered. <laughs> I didn't get murdered. Bless my parents. I know they were they thought I was going to get murdered, but uh. <laughs> <laughs> But and did you just kind of know that you were going to be okay? Yes, I did. But I mean, it was, it doesn't take away from the scariness or the uncomfortableness of it. Um, You know, I had the cushion of that, that bit of money that I'd saved and I'd worked really hard for that year. Um, I had that and I did a ton of research on New York and being an actor in New York. I, so I felt like I had information and then from there, it was just like a calculated risk, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, again, nobody moved me. I didn't really have anything set up or lined up. It, it, the stars <laughs> aligned as it tends to do when you take risks like that. Um, yeah. And I think maybe at this age as well, there's an element of rediscovering that kind of fearlessness mm. that I had in my early twenties mm. when I thought I really could do anything. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I'm remembering that, oh yeah, no, there, I can do a lot and there's a lot I don't know. Um, but I know that ultimately I'll be okay. Yeah. And so it's to hopping back into that, that, oh, there's so much potential out here. There's so much that's possible and being okay with the uncertainty mm-hmm. and just knowing, oh, okay. I don't know what the path is going to look like, but it's totally fine. I'm going to be totally fine. And you are, and you're going to be beyond fine. I know that. I know you have a hard stop. I'm going to let you go. I could talk to you forever, but I'm going to no. let you go. And uh, maybe we will have to check in further on down the line and see how all this rolls for you. And uh, I'm so excited. I'm so excited for people to hear your story. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there you have it. You know, generally... I'm someone who doesn't really want to talk about grief, dying, and death. (laughs) But uh, honestly, I could have talked with Charlene forever. I mean, let's face it, most of us don't want to talk about it. But how much better off might we be if we start to 
break that taboo? Can we prepare ourselves better? I wonder. Talking to Charlene also reminded me of my conversation with Linda Rule Flynn um, way back in episode 20. You might remember, if if you've been with me a while, that Linda reluctantly took over her mother's flower pressing business after her mom passed away. Much like Charlene, Linda found herself with a new calling after the passing of her mother and discovered herself in the process. And perhaps that's what we're meant to do after the passing of our parents. If you want to know more about Charlene and her Grief, Grit, Grace project, I'll have that information for you in the show notes. And while you're there, you can take a look at the curated illustrations we talked about. Uh, Just go to latebloomerliving.com forward slash podcast and click on the show notes for episode 61. Thanks to all of you who have taken time to review and rate the podcast. I really appreciate your support. And here's your reminder that the end of season one is coming right up. I hope you'll join me next week on August 11th for the last show of this season. I'm planning something special for that episode. Um, And then I'll be taking three weeks off to head out west for a family visit before launching season two on September 8th. Thanks so much for listening. Um, Hey, if you've been with me for the entire first season, I'm so grateful for your support. If you're new to the podcast, thanks so much for joining in. I'm so happy you found me. While I'm gone, that's three weeks when you can go back to those older episodes you might have missed and see what captures your fancy. In fact, I think I'll include a link to episode 20 with Linda Rule Flynn in the show notes so you can listen again or discover it for the first time. It's a really neat story. Um, Yeah, so I hope you are having a great summer. We may be late bloomers, but it's never too late. Have a fantastic week. Stay safe and well. Talk soon.